So moving ahead with our event, we have a next speaker here already. Uh, good evening, Arjun, sir. Good evening, Karen, ma'am. So, sir, with your permission, I would like to uh, introduce you. If that's okay. Uh, yes, sir. So, with immense honor, I introduce to you our next guest, Arjun Malhotra, an entrepreneur, industrialist, board of advisor, philanthropist, and much more. Arjun, sir, is an Indian entrepreneur, industrialist, and in 1975, sir co founded HCL Group, where he served as a vice chair. He also founded TechSpan and served as a chief executive officer of a US based firm, Headstrong, after the two companies merged. He also co founded Spickmakin. Sir is on the board of governors for prestigious institutions, including the IIT Kharagpur Foundation, Indian School of Business, Hyderabad, Rajiv Gandhi Indian Institute of Management, Shillong, I am Udaipur, and the Doon School, Dehradun. In addition, he founded the Professor G.S. Sanyal School of Telecommunication at IIT Kharagpur. Arjun sir holds a Bachelor of Technology with honors in Electrical and Electronics Communication Engineering from IIT Kharagpur itself and earned the B.C. Roy Gold Medal. He was honored with a Doctors of Science degree and named Life Fellow of IIT Kharagpur. Uh, Malhotra sir also attended the Advanced Management Program of Harvard Business School. Thank you, sir, for taking uh, time out of your busy schedule to address the students today. So we'll be continued. Yes, sir. So moderating our session, uh, we'll be continuing with Miss Karen Ma. And for the new joinees, I'll be taking the liberty to reintroduce Ma. Again. So uh, Miss Karen uh, Sheva is a social entrepreneur, mentor, writer, and a speaker. She firmly believes in the power of citizenship, entrepreneurship and partnership for addressing some of the world's most pressing issues. A self-professed acad academian, academian at heart, she was designed multiple theories and models based on the rise shared values, responsible, inclusive, sustainable, and eco-friendly for uh, driving positive action by individuals and institutions. Ma'am, I hand over the session to you tomorrow. Thank you so very much, Abhimanyu. And welcome, Arjun, sir. Uh, truly, truly a pleasure. Um, actually, I have a confession to make to you and the whole uh, you know, audience as well. Uh, this is totally a fan moment for a rookie engineer who started her career um, selling marketing HCL computers. <laughs> Good for you. Which year was this? <laughs> oh my God, you want me to tell my age now? <laughs> no, no, I just want to know which year you were there and which office. <laughs> uh, so this is, uh, oh, I was with uh, with Business Link, which was a uh, dealer for HCL, uh, but in Bombay, in Bombay in those days, of course. Yeah, so a little before. So, yeah. So, so beans, you, sold, you sold a beanstalk machines. Yes. Oh my goodness me. Wow. Talk about memories and going back. <laughs> so like I said, totally a fan moment to be able to be talking to you today. Thank you so much and welcome to this uh, session here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, again, as I said, you know, you drove and built one of the largest uh, computer companies, technology companies in India. And of course, a string of them after that. We are in an entrepreneurial um, session. What made you feel, and you also have this, uh, um, I think a, a letter or an article that says, you know, to change, start a business to change the world. What did you want to change and how did you start your journey? So, you know, it's a bit of a story. I have to talk a little bit about history and about a time that I don't think most young kids know. India was a socialist country, you know, and we had an act called the Monopolies and Restrictive Trade Practices Act that actually stopped large private companies from getting into new areas. The government, in its wisdom, felt that that should be reserved for public sector undertakings. I joined DCM out of college. Uh, as a senior management trainee. And that's a story that I'll tell at another time. But uh, we worked there for, I worked there for five years. And uh, the reason I stayed back was uh, one year after I joined, uh, 
they decided to get into electronics. And uh, I was given country responsibility for this new product, electronic calculators that were coming out. And we, of course, developed a great R&D team and adapted calculators, uh, had 80, 90% of the market, very nice volumes, uh, very nice margins in that business. And as you develop more and more, we ultimately made our own computer or designed our own computer. And microprocessors were just coming out at that time. DCM, in their wisdom, their advice from their internal department, and I've got to warn everyone that large companies have legal and administration departments whose job, in my view, is to tell them how not to do things. And, uh, you know, and that's what happened at DCM. And we just felt that microprocessors as a technology were really going to change the world. And when we looked at our competition, it was IBM and ICL who were selling old technology in India at that time. So six of us decided to leave and start a company. I got to tell you, no business plan, no money, just that we knew the market and we were convinced that microprocessors were going to make a difference. They're going to change everything. That's what the plan was. And that's really what we ended up doing. It was really passion, couple of, uh, couple of very interesting breaks that came our way uh, that solved the problem of money. And of course, we knew the market. We had good technology people with us and you know, the rest is history. Absolutely. I think that's called visionary, <laughs> right? If you can foresee, and I think that's, some, that's a word that has been used in many of your interviews and many of your uh, descriptions. So I, I completely uh, would agree with that based on what you have been able to build. Um, other than entrepreneurship, you've also played as they introduced you, you know, uh, you've not just stopped at that one, one, uh, one top of uh, one, one. I'm sorry, what's happening to me? <laughs> See, this is what happens in fan moments and fan interviews. It doesn't happen to me normally. Yeah. Um, but in terms of how you started one company, but then from there very rapidly, you know, while you did build for a substantial number of years with that CL, you also did not just stop there. There's so much else that you, you started with. Uh, what makes you be the serial entrepreneur? And why? So, you know, again, it's a longer story. 10 years after we started HCL, I sort of started getting bored. I thought, uh, you know, I always wanted to get into academics. I come from a family of academics, basically, uh, other than my dad, who was in the army. Uh, and I thought, you know, I've done enough. The company had grown. It was 2,000 people at that time. Uh, let me go back, do my PhD, and uh, work. I wanted to work for NASA. That was my plan when I was at college. Uh, and so I took some time off. I That's when I went for that program to the Harvard Business School. And I came to the conclusion that I was missing the fun of a startup. I really didn't want to run a big company. You know, I didn't want to... In those days, when you sent a circular, by the time it went to your remotest office and got implemented, it took 30 days, right? Technology was like that. Uh, I, would, I would rather get people into a room, tell them, let's do this. We walk out and everyone does that from that moment onwards. So when I came back to uh, HCL in 1985 from that uh, Harvard Business School Advanced Management Program, I told them I didn't want my old job back. I would rather look at some new initiative, new projects that came up. And we started this whole concept at that time of what we call intrapreneurship. So I was allocated 25 lakhs internally, uh, you know, with no questions asked. And I was asked to start a division for CAD CAM, uh, computer aided design and manufacturing. And if I needed more money, I could always go back, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, you had to look embarrassed at that time. And I was told that you can't only have fun, which is right, uh, that you also, if any division runs into a problem, you'll have to take care of it. And so I thought that was only fair. And that's how we started CAD CAM. Uh, in fact, uh, we had done that uh, in a way in 1980 when uh, Rajinder Pawar, R.S. Pawar, was our corporate planning manager. And uh, in those days, we were selling 200 machines. DCM was selling 200 machines. ORG, which was the Sarabai group, was selling 200 machines. 
And uh, Pawar came up with a program saying how we could sell a thousand machines a year. And basically, he the questions that were asked were, where were we going to get a thousand voltage stabilizers? Where were we going to get a thousand air conditioners? And where were we going to get a thousand programmers? Right. And so he gave us a white paper which said that uh, don't look at the shortage of programmers as a problem, look at it as an opportunity. And let's start an uh, organization that actually trains people and gives them real skills and knowledge rather than just a certificate. And so we told him, if you're willing to put your, you know, so that's how NIT started, basically. We, okay. we funded, yeah, we funded 80% of it. Uh, we took 80% of the stock and 20% we kept for Pawar and his team. And, uh, you know, again, I look back and think about it, and it's strange how uh, some of these things, you come back, you come to the U.S. and you realize that, hey, it had already been done, but we lived in a closed economy. We didn't know that kind of stuff existed. I think that's a perfect segue to my next question because you went international very, very quickly, much before most other Indian tech companies did. Because mostly it would be the other way around where they would enter on their own rather than uh, Indian companies going out. Um, how much is the domestic market versus the international market critical for scale? Today, things are different. Today, I think the domestic market is large enough that we can dictate to people if we want stuff made in India. Um, you know, the government is talking about, quote unquote, 100 million tablets. Uh, even at a million, you can dictate to chip manufacturers, component manufacturers that you'll only buy if they make in India. And uh, so you, it, it is a great time for the Indian component industry to come up, uh, which wasn't true in our time because we couldn't dictate. Uh, but what we did was in 1970, uh, 1980, sorry, when we were a three crore company, we decided to go to Singapore and manufacture computers there, our computers. Uh, in fact, we got pioneer status at Singapore. We were the first computer manufacturer that went to Singapore. The model was very simple. We weren't selling computers, we were selling solutions. And so, we set up what we called Software Export Division, SED, in uh, Madras, uh, now Chennai, only because there were three Singapore airline flights a week between Madras and Singapore. And we used to send the specs back to Madras, uh, write the programs on floppies, send the floppies back to Singapore, and they would then implement it out there. You know, that's sort of how that started in 1980. And we had two of our six founders relocate to Singapore to run that unit. So it's, you know, and we were a hardware company. HCL was a hardware company in those days. We came to the US in 1988, 89, because we had developed a microprocessor. Okay, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. So India, because it was aligned with the Soviet bloc in those days, there were restrictions on US technology coming to India. So most people in India read the latest magazines. So they want the latest chipsets on their in their computer, whereas we weren't allowed to import them. So we couldn't give it to them. So to give them the power of those chipsets, we did, we did a multiprocessor computer development. And Unix, because the sources were available, we were able to port Unix on that multiprocessor and add things like compilers, add things like schoolers, and make it a commercial system from a scientific system. And at one of our Computer Society of India exhibition conventions, there was a vice president from AT&T who had come and he was very impressed because AT&T had bought Unix. He was very impressed with the work we had done. So we got McKinsey to do a study to see if we could enter the US market. And there was a gap, uh, multiprocessor Unix machines were being sold for a million dollars by Pyramid and MIPS. And our product would have gone out uh, for about 100,000 US at that time. And uh, we had our own compilers and stuff on it. So we decided to go to the US to sell hardware. That's how we first came to the US and started uh, what is now known as HCL Technologies but it was called HCL America at that time. Right. That's why, that's how we got in here. Great. Uh, the other question you 
Yeah, sorry. sorry. <laughs> the, the other part of the question was, how, why did I become a serial entrepreneur? It's only because I like startups. So when, uh, when I was turning 50 or close to 50, I thought I'd spent enough time in HCL, you know, in the sense uh, the company had grown, uh, it was a big company. I wanted to fool around on the internet because that technology was just coming in. HCL by that time was a public company. If HCL had been a private company, I would have still been in HCL. But I thought, and they, their strategy was right from their point of view. They said, why fool around at the edge of technology? Let's look at which direction it's going. And once that direction is clear, then let's invest heavily behind that. Right. And that made sense for the company. But it was not fun for me. Let me put it that way. So, and I thought it was unfair for me to use quote unquote public money to do something that I wanted to do. Although the company was pretty okay with it, I think. So I decided to leave. And, uh, you know, that's, it ended up starting another company uh, that morphed into Headstrong. And, you know, ultimately when you want to build, in my view, when you want to build a company, it takes you seven, 10, 11 years mm -hmm. before it gets to a certain size. I mean, uh, time, there are times during the bubble and stuff where within a year or two, you can make a company, sell it for a lot of money and get out. But if you really want something that will stay for a while, that build an institution, let me put it, you can't do it in one or two years. Okay. Even look at Amazon, look at, uh, you know, Meta now, or Facebook. I mean, they all take time. I mean, they start off as really nice companies, grow very quickly, but they take time to become institutions. So would you say, actually, I, I'm sorry, I interrupted you earlier because some of those uh, terms were so, so filled with memories of long back. I, I doubt many of the uh, audience even would understand or relate to some of those names and words. So that was the reason why I came in. But I think when you look at, you know, your journey, it's been a mixture of one being ahead of your time, like you spoke about the CAT CAM but also understanding gaps very, very much more deeper, going deeper into those gaps. And I think very often as entrepreneurs, we don't spend enough time in really understanding our ecosystem enough to realize where the opportunities are. Would you say that as is a fair estimate of? Yes, I, I, you know, what happens is, let me put it this way, when I talk to people, who want to become entrepreneurs, I tell them you can't have an ego. And I keep getting pushback saying that, look at Larry Ellison, look at all these people, look at uh, Elon Musk today, big egos. But big egos come only when you get to be successful. Then you can afford to have an ego. But when you're in a startup phase, you're making lots of decisions. I guarantee you lots of them are not right. They are wrong. And you have to accept wrong decisions quickly and change direction. And not just accept it, you have to accept it in front of your team. So they also understand that how, what you're doing and why you're doing it. And so that's why, you know, I think people have to be very agile. You have to have your ear to the ground. You have to talk to customers or at least get feedback from smart people who are working for you, who talk to customers and give you that feedback honestly, and then take decisions. I think most companies, unless they can do what I call not really crisis management, but management uh, by, on all these uh, important small things that come up. If you stick with what said, I know everything, I can tell the market what to do, you're a dead man in this business, right? And today, especially in our time, you could make, you could, you could make a few mistakes and survive because there weren't, wasn't that much competition, there wasn't VC money, you know, there weren't 20 companies doing the same thing. Today, you don't have that luxury. So you better have your ear to the ground. You better give up your ego. You better listen to what needs to be done and then get it done and surround yourself with, I always tell people, try and recruit people who are smarter than you. And, you know, it gives me great pride to look at a lot of ex-HCL people who are now heading companies, large companies. If you look at Tech Mahindra, you look at uh, Hexaware, they're all ex-HCL people, you know, and and in fact, we used to, if some when we asked a question, what do you want to do in five years? If someone said, I want your job in five years, that was a plus for recruitment, you know? And so, you know, we just did things a little differently, I think. Uh, in hindsight, uh, probably I'm, I'm trying to get those thoughts together. I haven't got them together. And, you know, people have been bugging me to write a book and I might just do that with, uh, with someone. 
to try and see how we built that culture. But yeah. Well, you can be sure that many from this uh, group over here will definitely be waiting with the, for that book the minute it is out uh, and we'll be reading it with great pleasure. Um, to go back to the, what you mentioned about Harvard and the, the, the change in your uh, you know, journey, right? Towards more of a startup environment. How important is that as an opportunity to kind of sharpen your saw, so to speak? And what is the value of education for someone who's already achieved so much? Yeah, because obviously that's what you did at that point. So. so, well, let me put it this way. If you're open to learning, the value of education is very, very high. So what I learned at Harvard, basically, I learned more from the people who were on the program than the professors. The professors were great. You know, they gave you the concepts, but talking to people who came from successful companies. Uh, and I, I realized one thing that when you talked about billions of dollars, I used to feel uncomfortable. Right. It still was an 80 crore company at that time. Uh, but when you talked about managing a thousand people, I was very comfortable, whereas most of my American colleagues at that program were very uncomfortable. So it was a question of, you know, what you were comfortable with, how you were able to manage and motivate people and stuff like that. I think uh, what people have to do today is a mix of both. And I think our biggest strength is if we can motivate people to do, ultimately companies are not run by individuals, although the press likes to show it that way. It is the people in the company who make it successful and you have to motivate them and make them feel good. And, you know, in a startup, you're not working eight hours a day. You're working, you know, like I know in HCL, even when we grew, no one would leave office before 10 o'clock at night. I mean, it was crazy, but uh, that's the way the culture was. People would come in and they'd be talking about what happened in the field and what problems they had and someone would have a solution. But it, it happened till, you know, I, I don't think any of our sales offices uh, really went home before 9, 10 o'clock at night. And we used to start early in the morning. So you've got to build that kind of culture. And, you know, that's something, that's a work ethic we have in India that I think is helping us. All of our people, when they go abroad, they find that their work ethic is very different to the work ethic of the people in that country. And, you know, that helps. I think it's that old, what we were told, Einstein's formula, 99% perspiration, 1% inspiration. I really believe that works. Mm. Well, I, I'll share a very small, uh, my anecdote, because one night uh, after working for days on end, late nights, my mother finally told me, why don't you just stay in the office? <laughs> <You know? laughs> so I completely remember those days again, but uh, at Etsy. So um, back again to, you know, entrepreneurs, uh, you are today, um, you know, supporting on the board of so many and investing in so many entrepreneurs, what is it that you look for when you uh, make your selection or decide to associate? So, yeah, so I, A, I look for the individuals. Do I, do they have the passion? Do they, are they really committed? How good is the team? I think ultimately, yes, you do look at the idea. Of course, you look at the market and stuff, but ultimately it's the individual or the individuals, I should say, you look at the team and you look at the passion. And the way I work it is, I, my, my son handles the investment, so I don't really get into that. I try and I'm much more a hands-on ops kind of person. That's I like to believe that. And so I try and talk to them and try and advise them on how to scale and grow and, you know, what to do in the operation, et cetera, et cetera. How to get the business model right, basically. Because that's ultimately, once you have it right, then it's really a question of managing growth and stuff. But if you're struggling with your business model, you know, and then until you get that stable and get that established, uh, there's no sense in spending too much money on trying to expand because it'll all go waste uh, kind of thing. So that's that's what I try to do. And I try and work uh, with a few companies. Most of them, fortunately for me, uh, Dune School, IIT Kharagpur, HCL, I've got enough and Headstrong now. I've got enough alumni who come up with ideas who I know. And so I tend to work with that small group most of the time. 
I'm it's sure not a small group. It's a big group. <laughs> it is a big group. Absolutely. Um, again, you know, when you talk about teams, and you know, our previous speaker also mentioned about teams. Um, you also came from. I mean, you also started HCL with six other founders. I mean, that's a large number to have. You know, typically today, if you see, uh, normally you'll have two or three that come together, and even then, there are a lot of problems. It may not be that visible, but it is. What does it take to keep founders together, if that's what is the starting point, and keeping teams together? Okay, and you know, you've got a very nice point. Because in HCL, the founders stayed together for 19 years, exactly. which is quite a record in some ways, all six of them. So a couple of things. One is we kept uh, the accounting completely transparent. Nice thing about computers is there are no cash transactions. So technically, there was no such. That problem never came up. Second thing, and I think more important than everything, oh, well, second and third. Second is all of us were friends. We'd worked together. And probably more important than that, our spouses got along with each other. So that worked out fairly well. And then the kids grew up together and, you know, ultimately. So now, even though we've sort of split, uh, everyone's doing their own thing, uh, the kids are still friends. You know, it's it's uh, it's nice. Um, you know, you disagree with a lot of people on things they're doing today, but uh, that doesn't spoil the break the relationship uh, in any way. So... I think that was, you know, when I look back at HCL and look at, you know, I think what we've done, one was, I think that how we stayed together for 19 years was really something people should learn from. I think the other important thing is we broke the glass ceiling, I think, for middle-class Indians to look at entrepreneurs, become entrepreneurs. I think to us that, that and I think, well, another good thing is uh, we sort of were able to tell people that you could create wealth without being a politician or doing things that were unsavory, if I use that term, uh, and doing it through an official way. And I think the IT industry is really largely built on that premise, which is one reason why it's done so well. And today, so many young people want to get into that industry. So, um, you know, again, your last and final avatar that we at least know of <laughs> is about philanthropy, right? And philanthropists. Um, what is it going to take to really change the world? Is it going to be philanthropy or is it going to be responsible business? I don't think it's either or. I think uh, Bill Gates and the whole gang in the US has sort of shown that in a way. Uh, and not all philanthropy uh, gets kudos. A lot of people go after him claiming that he's making money on vaccines and stuff like that, you know, which is quite strange. And you'll always get a number of views, as you can see, with all that fake news going around today and WhatsApp University and stuff like that. I mean, I, today I don't know what to believe. So I'm actually working with uh, IIT Kharagpur alum to try and, you know, when you, excuse me, when you make a video on your phone, if I can add a blockchain to it, then if someone changes it, you know it's been changed. It's not the original. So we're trying to see how we can do that to, <clears throat> excuse me, to news or stuff that goes out so that um, at least at some level you can identify uh, fake news and stuff like that. But I think ultimately, ultimately you have, I think the when you say, when will we get to a stage where progress will get made is when we treat every human being as a human being and not think that they're inferior because of caste or how they're birth or economics or color or any of that stuff or gender, you know, or <clears throat> any, any uh, handicap that they might have. So I think to me, that's the most important thing. And I found that when I was uh, selling computers in India, getting money out of customers becomes a big problem. You know, they everyone tries to delay payments, and that hasn't changed even today. And for most startups, if you don't get the money, you're in trouble. You know, you might be doing lots of sales, but if it's stuck in receivables, you have a problem. And I learned that if you actually treated that clerk who's got to process your uh, bill as a human being and talk to him not as if you were a superior being, but you know, sat with him, had a cup of tea with him, 
uh, and genuinely made him feel that, uh, you know, you were like him or uh, you didn't look down on him. I found uh, things really worked uh, uh, much easier and much better. And so, and the other thing I've got to say in India is people find it very, at least used to, find it very difficult to say thank you and sorry and stuff like that. And I found that, you know, by just doing that with some critical people in organizations, uh, you got a lot of mileage. I mean, ultimately, it's very simple to get people to remember you. And, you know, it's the small things that make the difference. And people tend to forget that. Absolutely, yes. Um, we are coming to the end. So I guess I would just say those of you who'd like to ask any specific questions, please put it out um, on the chat box and I'll definitely try and uh, share it with Arjun sir. Um, I think the other part of my question was social business. So I completely, uh, you know, agree. And what you say is, of course, we need both. But is the role of responsible business perhaps getting bigger and bigger as compared to philanthropy? Yes, yes, absolutely. In fact, uh, you know, how do I put it? I'll give my example. You know, when you leave college or when I left college, I should say, and I think this is true for most people and there are lots of IITNs on this, so I guess it's true for many of them, is you want to change the world. You think you've got this great education, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You step out of the portals of your institute and you say, I'm going to change the world. And then you get stuck in your job and, you know, whatever you're doing and, I turned 40 and I realized, hey, I hadn't changed the world. I mean, I wanted to do it and I got busy in transactions and whatever I was doing in, on life, basically. And that sort of slipped out of my priority list somewhere. So I sat down and talked to my wife and she had the same view. And we decided to uh, redefine what we call us, what you call our system boundaries. Said, let's define the world, not as the world, but as people in our world, you know, my driver, my cook, people like that. And let's change their world, I will change them. So first thing we said was, can't change them. They are already at a certain level, but let me educate their kids so that they get, they, you know, and I'll give them the same kind of education as I give my kid, provided they're interested in studying. And it's really worked wonders because my driver's daughter, uh, She's working as a business analyst in one of these IT companies, doing quite well, got married to one of the engineers there. Uh, they went to Paris and Switzerland for their honeymoon. And I was, you know, I was thinking, wow, you know, this is, they've sort of arrived kind of thing. But yeah, it did just make a difference. And so if we can do that, I think if everyone can just look at one or two people in their immediate uh, kind of world and try and make a difference in their lives, you'll make a difference overall. I mean, it, India is a big country and, uh, you know, we can do things, we scratch the surface from in different places, but if each of us can take that responsibility, I think we'll make a big difference. Great. Uh, thank you so much for that. Absolutely. I think that's great inspiration that each and every one of us have a role to play and we definitely can make the world a better place. Uh, so one of the questions that I have right now is uh, a little tough in the sense that to say is we're seeing mass layoffs by tech companies and people are expecting recessions next year. What would you suggest we do to sail through these uncertain times? So look, Times are uncertain. I, I really don't feel we'll have a recession. I think it's people thinking we'll have a recession. Nothing much has changed. The US seems to be okay. India seems to be okay. Uh, China may be having its own problems because they are sort of locking down with COVID or whatever. I, I really, I, I mean, if you guess wrong on the recession, you could probably, and I've done that a couple of times, you could probably lose market growth or whatever. I'm telling a few companies that I'm on the board that are in IT saying, why don't you take out an ad saying that I will recruit everyone who's laid off. Now, you may not recruit anyone who's laid off, but the image it'll give you in the market will be quite phenomenal. And so why don't, why don't companies do that? I find that really strange. Uh, I would do it if I was an HCL today and HCL was a growing company or in any company, if I was running it, I would put that ad out in, in a biggish ad it would get me more mileage than anyone else. Everyone's parents would see and they would advise their kids, 
their uncles and aunts would tell them that's a good company, you know, they're not laying off like the others, et cetera, et cetera. But I think, I, I don't think the market's going to slow down. I think, yes, uh, American companies have this, for them, you know, salary is a very important part of their overhead. Uh, it never used to be so in India. It's starting to happen now. So laying off people is not really the solution. And, you know, laying off just be, uh, without looking at performance and stuff is, I, I just think it's counterintuitive. In fact, what we did when the bubble burst at uh, TechSpan, uh, I remember the senior management, we were having a meeting and we had to cut down costs and everyone said, let's lay off. And my question was, okay, who gets who gets laid off in this room? And then we'll go down the organization. And of course, no one agreed to that. So we took a 20% pay cut uh, at the senior level. It didn't hurt you too much, but it took care of the costs in the company. And so to me, that's the important thing. I mean, someone who's earning a crore, why can't they get their salary down to 80 lakhs? It's not going to change their life. It's not going to make any difference. And it'll, you know, it'll save a lot of people who earn 10, 20,000 bucks a month. And for them, that 10, 20,000 bucks is a lot of money. And so that's the way you got to look at it, according to me. I think the reaction from our group tells you how important and how much that has struck a chord with all of them. Uh, I think the disparity today in, in especially uh, remunerations is a very, very sticky and, and you know, controversial topic. And I think you saying it out loud, I think definitely has endured you to a lot in the group over here. Um, so again, we are coming to the end. So uh, again, encouraging any questions out there. Uh, but I'm going to maybe ask you a question which might not really um, be so valid or relevant to a person who's been this successful. But still, I'm going to ask that. Any failures that you can share with us? Sure, lots of them, actually. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, in HCL, we had got to a point where we thought we could do anything. You know, it, it was just everything we were doing was working out. And so you start believing that you know what's going on. So two things I talk about here. One is that the market wanted multi-terminal. The market, that was the fashion, let me put it that way. But the actual usage that people had was for a big batch machine. And so we made a big batch machine called the System 4. I still remember that. Believing that we could tell the market what they needed. And that's how Wipro came up in computers. But we nearly lost the market. We nearly lost the plan. Uh, it took us two years. We only survived because we had a very aggressive sales team that did sell a lot of those computers. But, uh, you know, it, it was one time where we said, let's not we don't know, let's listen to the market rather than us telling the market what it needs. That was one. And the second was, we decided uh, we were in doing computers. We said, why can't we do electronic cash registers? The mechanical cash registers are very old and we had replaced mechanical calculators with electronic calculators in our time. So why don't we do electronic cash registers? We did it, but we were a failure because cash registers are largely mechanical, the drawer opening and all that stuff. And that wasn't our expertise. The electronics part we knew really well. So we ultimately struggled with it for a couple of years and then sold it to Bradma of India, who really were in that business, new mechanical engineering, and they leveraged our uh, electronics uh, uh, R&D tech, and they were successful with that product, we weren't. And so you number of lessons you learned uh, uh, I think the most important thing was, hey, listen to the market. Don't try and don't try and say, I've got a product, everyone will line up and buy it. It's not going to happen, right? So just you've got to listen to what they need and make a product, even if it's not the best uh, technology or the best thing for them. That's what they need. It's like fashion, no. you know? So most likely my last question, uh, unless something else comes up in the middle, but you know, most entrepreneurs, when they get started, especially when it is IIT, I think are already thinking about the investors and, you know, what kind of valuation they will get and, you know, how will they be able to scale, et cetera. What would be your advice to, to such entrepreneurs, um, both in terms of the funding, in terms of the scale that they should get? 
So I just one thing, when you take money from anyone, whether you borrow it or an investor puts it, try and treat it like as if it's your own money. In fact, try and be more careful than if it was your own money. And the second thing is, you have when you ask someone for valuation, you try and look at it dispassionately about how you would value it yourself. If someone came to you and asked you for that investment and you had the money, right? So just try and put yourself in the other person's shoes. I think that's what I'm trying to say before you decide, because everyone tends to feel that uh, they've got a great idea. It's, you know, it should be worth blah, blah, and et cetera, et cetera. But try and look at it if someone came to you with an idea that they thought was great, how would you look at funding it or how would you look at it? Because the other person looks at it in somewhat similar way. And remember, they have a lot more experience than you have. They've talked to a lot more people than you have talked to, right? And so I would go to them and listen to them and listen to the kind of questions they are asking and then try and work out answers to those questions as part of my plan, thinking, business plan, whatever you, you have, so that when you talk to them or the next person, you're a little more knowledgeable about what they're going to be asking, and you can probably put them at ease. But yeah, just remember when, again, when people look at it, they look at your passion, they look at your team, and they look at your idea and the market which it addresses. And remember one thing, I might think I have a nice niche that I'm going after, when a, invariably you will change your plan or your product as you get deeper into that niche. And unless you have a big marketplace behind it, if it's only a small niche, you'll get stuck and you'll have to get out of it uh, without any success if that thing changes. But if it's a big market, you can maneuver yourself into some other part of that market that might give you uh, the kind of revenue that you're looking at. So yeah, so that's I know how I would... Uh, thank you so much. I know I said uh, last question, but maybe one last, literally. And this is maybe slightly personal because of your interest in the uh, Society for the Promotion of Indian Classical Music and Culture Among Youth. We both have youth, and I think a lot of people who would have interest in this area. So maybe a little bit about that, and, and I, I promise you we'll close and not keep you much longer. <laughs> okay, so, so the driving force uh, behind... Uh... Spit McKay is really Kiran Seth. And Kiran's a friend and a batchmate from IIT Kharagpur. So that's how it, the way it got started was we were sitting one winter afternoon in Delhi, Kiran, myself, uh, uh, Bobby Barwa, who was president of Hindu College at that time, was passed away, unfortunately, and a batchmate of his from Columbia Business School, um, Mahinda Malu, who was who's also passed away, unfortunately. But he was a uh, managing director of Haryana Breweries. So he'd got a crate of rosy pelican beer. So we're having beer on this uh, Sunday afternoon, sitting in the sun, Delhi winter, and talking about uh, how culturally young people are going towards so-called Western culture rather than Indian culture, and decided let's do something about it. So we couldn't think of a name for the society, but so that's why the objective of the society became the name. And uh, on uh, uh, Oxford Sheets, we wrote down the objectives and uh, signed it. And that's how Spick McKay started. But I've got to add another story to this. So when we started that software export division in Madras, software was not considered an industry. It was considered a trade. So we came under the Shops and Establishments Act, not the Industries Act. And so we had to maintain these 12 registers, which was really, I mean, very complicated. We weren't quite used to it. So Shiv Nada was, was said that he'd uh, coordinate with the Tamil Nadu government to get it classified as an industry. Okay, so that's a little background. What happened in Spikmike was Kiran uh, said, uh, talked to me and said he wanted a little publicity. And we had a massive advertising budget in HCL. Uh, every first Monday of every month, a full page ad in every major newspaper in the country. So I talked to my advertising agency and said, look, you guys are making a lot of money from us. So why don't you give me a one column centimeter ad in the Hindustan Times, uh, you know, once a month, where I will say Debu Chaudhary is performing at Lady Sriram College or something, Spikmake, courtesy Spikmake or whatever. 
So one day Shiv comes to me, I think three or four months after he was coordinating or trying to leverage the Tamil Nadu government. And he said, hey, uh, software has been cleared as an industry. And said, uh, you know, no, no. He came and said, what is this pick make? So I thought, oh shit, you know, the quote unquote, Mary Churi Pakri Gai, as they say. So I asked him, why, why, what's happened? He said, oh, software has been cleared as an industry. I said, how did that happen? He said, the uh, Tamil Nadu IAS type people said that if HCL is advertising for someone like Spick McKay, then the company has a soul. So we'll take your word for it. Okay. And you know, so technically you got to credit Spick McKay for getting software to become an industry in India. And look what it's done to the country right now, you know, <laughs> so. I think this just goes to show that there's a lot of benefit when you you have inclusive thinking. In fact, I always use this line that inclusive thinking requires very exclusive thoughts, you know, and you never really know and understand the pathways to get back the benefit of the good that you do in some way. So, Chori Nethi, sir, acha kaun tha. Yeah, but yeah, that's, uh, that, yeah, it's very true. Actually, I have noticed that a number of times that if you have feel positively about things you've done, then a lot of things work out for you in a positive way, because I think your attitude itself is like that. And so, you know, it's like when you go into an interview with a positive frame of mind, you're very likely to do a lot better than if you feel, I don't know if anything will, you know, stuff like that. So like you always got to go into a exam thinking you'll get 100%. Otherwise, you're in trouble. So, well, I hope you came in thinking really positive. I'm pretty sure uh, going by the uh, thumbs up and the lovely reactions we are seeing from the group. Uh, I've had a fantastic time. And as I said, for me, this was total deja vu uh, and a fan moment. So thank you so much for your time. Truly, truly appreciate it. And over back to the, uh, to the IHT. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, Arjun, sir, for addressing all the budding entrepreneurs we have here with your words of wisdom. I really believe students learned a lot from you and will draw from your experiences which would help them in the future. Thank you, Karen Ma, for capturing the audience so well with your effortless moderation. With this, thank you. Abhimanyu Yadav, on behalf of eClub SGM from IIT Bombay, conclude today's session of eConflict 2020. Uh, one important announcement for all the students. Tomorrow's session will be starting at 4.15 p.m. instead of the earlier mentioned 5 p.m. Thank you so Thank much. You. Bye -bye. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye now. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, again, repeating the announcement. Tomorrow's session at 4.15 p.m. instead of the earlier mentioned 5 p.m. Thank you everyone for joining.